Well, welcome, David and Crystal Knapp. I'm so delighted to have you both on. We've known you, David, for what, maybe five years now? Five years, yeah. Yeah, and Crystal, you're Great. the newcomer too, about two or three years. <laughs> uh, it's so welcome very much on behalf of the woman I love and we choose to, our We Choose to Thrive book launch. We felt that this would be a really cool way to get let others know the work that you are doing because I feel it fits just right in hand, hand in hand with um, the, the reach that I have in my audience for women and men really that have faced um, abuse. No matter what kind of abuse it is, it's abuse and helping them to overcome it and stand and live and thrive. So welcome both of you to, to this interview. So David is... David is father of eight and grandfather of 28, has, has been a student of life experiences, most notably that of loss. In addition to life losses like the death of parents, loss of employment, he's had the unfortunate experience of losing two wives to cancer. His passion to help others understand the grieving process with the goal of helping those who experience loss began with the publication of his book, I Didn't Know What to Say, being a better friend to those who experience loss. And he has extended his this into a speaking ministry on grief. And I had the privilege of working with David on this, and it's been amazing to see what a transformation, what that what has transpired since the publishing of that book. He's a sought-after national speaker. He's a public published writer of a grit. Um, newspaper, Christian Herald Magazine, Brown Gold Magazine, all kinds of amazing things. And we will get into that more in our discussion. And then Crystal, his wife, his beautiful wife, is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Re Reach Up Magazine. She graduated from Vanguard University with a bachelor's degree in Christian education. She's been a teacher, a children's pastor, and marketing assistant. And she... Um, let's see, besides her work with the magazine, she loves to assist and accompany her twice-widowed husband, David, with the conferences on grief relief ministries when visit their 28 grandchildren. And I tell you, these two people are very busy, and we're so happy to have you here today. So I want to start with ladies first. <laughs> I'll start with you, Crystal. Um, so with... What is Reach Up Magazine? You you have Reach Up Magazine that you've been working with, doing a lot of work with in, um, all over the U.S. actually, right? Right. Reach Up Magazine uh, has been nine years in publication. It is a magazine that targets women that are marginalized, meaning they live at or below the line of poverty. Uh, they may live in shelters. They may be in prison. They may be... Um, in food uh, lines or getting their food from food pantries, but definitely there's the women that have been pretty much forgotten by magazine publications. There's nothing out there for them that speaks realistically about what their concerns are and what their budgets are like. So what got you, what made you want to start Reach Up? And it is a nonprofit right now. Yes, definitely. Uh, I had lived and worked in the inner city of New York for nine years, and I, as a part of that work, I was in and out of the women's homes on a constant basis. And um, one thing you know is that there is a, a lack or a depth of, of, of handing down of just common knowledge things from the generations, mostly because of drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. There's that lapse. And then once you've got a void, then the next generation has less of a void. So I saw a lot of things that just were common sense. Then I recognized there is nothing in the stores for them. There's nothing that would be um, that they could use for self-help. Um, so after having a conference, and I, I showed them some magazines, and I just left them out there, but they were way you know, much beyond uh, the financial grasp of women in mind. Um, they loved it. And they were so inspired to do things. And I thought, you know what? Sometimes we, we don't recognize that we can connect the dots and people can lift themselves up because they're enjoying what they're reading or they're enjoying something. That is so amazing. So, so, that. 
Are we having a time lapse a little bit on your on the speaking? I'm hearing you fine. Okay. It's okay. Okay, good. So, um, describe your reader. Who's your target market? She's um, a mom, generally. Um, that could be anywhere from 18 up. She may have to provide totally for her family. She might be on food stamps and welfare, but she also may be working. She may be in prison. We definitely work through uh, organizations that work with prisons and um, folks that just get out of prison. Uh, they call that the second prison, actually. Um, we have we work with shelters, counseling um, services, people that are seeking more help or needing more help. Uh, we work with shelters and they distribute it. So our, our um, reader is female and we would call her disenfranchised or underserved, but they're the, the, the group of people that often um, first responders as far as in nonprofits, they're the ones that go to and help them either through the shelters, the counseling services, food programs for their kids, um, that kind of a thing. So uh, your magazine is free to them? Yes. Okay, and free to them and to the organizations that distribute them. That's amazing. And in uh, what what do you put in this magazine? What are the what kind of content is there? We um, can write on a variety. It kind of depends on what I get from writers. But we like to have um, things on nutrition, on health, basic health things. Um, also, we talk about some of the more uh, nitty-gritty things, um, relationships with, with men, abusive relationships, how to get out of it, how to recognize that you're in one. Um, we talk about how to talk with your children. Um, well, we have, um, we've had our articles on uh, mis misperceptions about uh, what is acceptable for your kids to hear and to, to have in the home. Um, because again, most of my writers understand they've been in that environment and we, we've seen a lot so we can address it. Um, and we've had, oh, excellent first person from women that have come out of prostitution and homelessness who have come out of it and they're, they're restored to their families and uh, it's been pretty cool. That is amazing. It's such a such a needed factor. I don't think many people ever even thought about how, what a great need there was for that. So how far reaching is your magazine? How far out have you gone? Have you got into major cities or you're going oh. into smaller communities? Um, We're doing both. We, um, we are in extensively in the Phoenix area, naturally, but we are in California. We're in uh, Kansas City. We're in Atlanta. We're in a lot of towns in Florida and prisons in Florida. Um, some in New York need to develop that a little bit more. Surprisingly, a lot in Spokane, Washington. Um, we're, we're kind of all over. As, as, as our con connections grow, um, that's how it's happening. It's so it's just, is, rural. It, is the magazine um, subscription-based? Is it available on subscription? Modified, actually, that subscription base mostly is from the distributing organizations. So, you know, it might be an organization that has a shelter. Well, they may only order six, but it also may be a mission, and they may order 500. It okay. goes anyway. All right. So if, you know, I have so many listeners, and a lot of the women that have gone through the experiences that, they've written about in the We Choose to Thrive book. They, their way of giving back is working with the shelters. And that's, a good many of them do that. So how would they reach out to you in order to help you get your message or your, you know, the Reach Up magazine, your message out to their own communities? 
well, I can give you my uh, email, which is reachupmag at gmail.com. That would be one way. Our website is www.reachupmag.org, and you, they can sign up. Um, call me. I don't know if I can get that phone number, but, uh, you know. Uh, ambassadors, ambassadors. Oh, explain. Yeah. We have a, also a program that we're looking for to expand with Reach Up Magazine, and we're looking for people that would be ambassadors for Reach Up in their community. And what that entails simply would be uh, oftentimes organizations that use the magazine or even finding places that could use them, it takes a personal touch at that level. And for we are just two people here in one location, right. and there's uh, all over the country, there's places and organizations and niches where the magazine could be used, but somebody needs to put a face and feet to the ministry, to the to the mission of Reach Up Magazine. So we're looking for people who would be ambassadors in their community for the magazine to distribute it, perhaps, or find places, and even keep an eye out for folks that would fund it. Because being a, a nonprofit, uh, funding is a, a, a big issue, as is with a lot of organizations like this. And uh, donations are, are vital to keep it going. And oftentimes, that because of the type of ministry Reach Up is, it takes educating. Uh, people understand right. charity when it comes to meeting physical needs like soup kitchens and, and clothes closets. But they don't understand the second level of, of support is what Reach Up does. And it's it takes a little bit more educating of actual potential donors for them to actually see here look okay we're keeping these people alive we want to help them go from there and get restored to full uh, full societal function and they need encouragement and education and help to do that and that's what reach up does not everybody thinks to donate to causes that do that that's not so an immediate thought that comes to mind it's not and that's why we need ambassadors in many, many communities across the country to help fill that education gap, the education of the donors even, that they'll get behind uh, the magazine and also help us keep the, the vision alive throughout the community. So we're looking for, for donors, we're looking for places to use the magazine, and we're looking for people that would be filling that gap of being at what, would we, what we're calling an ambassador. So how have you been able to get funded so far? Much of the funding has been private donation. There's been a few corporate small gifts, um, but our, our support base uh, is a bit weak right now. We don't have enough uh, regular funders uh, oftentimes. In the last couple of years, we've actually had to skip a, uh, an issue or two because the funding wasn't there to, to make it happen. And so it is by donation only, but we are looking for uh, for more corporate donations for and businesses sponsorships, and, because right. somebody could sponsor an entire issue a portion issue or enough for a city you know if they come from a certain city uh, they could we can have ways of acknowledging their goodwill on the back of the magazine so we've come up with different areas so well now we we will provide in that ambassadorship uh, training and materials so that they're not coming off cold, you know, or not really knowing. We, we would love to, to assist in that. Well, let's hope this call kind of generates yeah. some of that. That would be really super cool. Uh, what about a reach up for men? Don't, men need this, don't they? They do, and we're getting more and more requests for something like that. Um, at the moment, we're, to be totally frank, we're overwhelmed with just doing this one uh, yeah. for women. Uh, it is in our conversation that someday we could possibly do one that would be uh, for men. But uh, the one for the women is where we started, where God has led, and uh, we're pretty much taken up with that one at this time as I far as... I would see why. Yeah. Yeah. Time, well, personnel and uh, funding, this is all we can do at the moment. But the need is there, it's huge. It's huge. So there's 24 million women living at or below the line of poverty. Mm -hmm. And Becky, 
I have not found one magazine that targets them. Not one in the print right. world. Right. And I think most of that is the awareness because most of us don't even, we think about, well, they need food in their tummies and they need, you know, a roof over their head. We don't think about the, the other effects, the, the long range things that once those needs are met and they're still in the struggling stage that they need these other, these other things to help them to grow and to, to, to really blossom. Amazing. And I, and I hope this interview will bring some of that, but we'll, this interview will also be spread throughout the whole, you know, quite a bit of social media. So hopefully, and be put on my website, you'll be able to share it to yours. So maybe there will be a way that, that we get to. some more exposure to this. Thank now you. for you, Mr. David. <laughs> Hi. You know, um, I've watched, because we've known each other, and we did a whole lot of work when you were first publishing your book. We did a lot of videos. We did, you know, kind of creating websites, getting everything rolling, getting ready for your book to be published on grief relief. Tell us about some about your journey with this. Um, anyhow, for, I want to thank you for that. Um, just for, <laughs> so everybody that's watching realizes that any success that I've seen in getting the book out and all the speaking conferences I've had and all that stuff actually began not just with my heart and vision to do that, but with Becky, without Becky's help, I'd still be thinking about it. Aww. And uh, she was able, she brought to the table the opportunity for me to have somebody who knew what they were doing and had the connections and experience. And yes, together we made that happen. And she was, she's been a phenomenal friend and colleague in this whole journey. Aww. But as you had said earlier, my, my, the great, the book itself and the grief relief ministries that uh, I founded actually have come out of my life experiences. Um, what, how it kind of culminized, uh, I've had, like you said, the unfortunate experiences of losing two wives to cancer. I've also lost a major job. I've uh, had other common losses, such as all my, all my parents and in-laws have passed away um, and just normal losses in life. But what happened after my second wife died, um, so I had uh, opportunities. People, after, within three months after that, people started asking me, Dave, that's kind of an unusual experience. I can't imagine what it was like. Would you come and, and speak to our, my group or our church or our business organization and share some of the things that you learned so we can benefit from that? So I would do that, and from that I'd get a lot of requests or is, do you have anything in print? This is amazing. But then a few months later, um, a, a, a good friend of ours, very good friend of ours, I noted that they didn't even send a thank you, a note, a sympathy card, no phone call, and even nothing after my second wife died. And I took note of that. Oh, why didn't they respond? That within a few months, I was at a funeral together, and they were there. And they sheepishly come up to me, hand in hand, head down, and said, Dave, we tried many times to sit down and write to you, but we didn't know what to say. And I thought, well, I do. I know what you could have said. And so I needed to write down my story, my example, to help other people understand the whole grieving process and the simple things that you can and and should do to help somebody who's gone through that experience. Well, that is, it's, it is really tough. And I have been in that position myself where you just don't have the words to say. And, you know, you don't want to feel like make them feel worse. It sometimes feels so awkward. But you've really, right. with your book, you've, you've formed the bridge, so to speak, to, to help us to know what to say. But even more important, what not to say. So what, what would you say what not to say? One of the things that commonly will make a griever roll their eyes, at least in their minds, is someone coming up to them and trying to empathize by comparing their grief experience with something the griever is going through. I mean, even something as stupid, and I've had this happen, somebody says, oh, I know how you feel. I lost a cat one time. <laughs> oh. uh, excuse me. Um, the, you know, talk about the urge to 
urge to kill here. Um, and, you know, they might have been endeared to the cat, and I don't d disclaim that. Any form of comparative comments um, demeans the grief of the griever, and you don't want to do that. You, in fact, what the griever needs is is acknowledgement of their grief. That's more important than any experience that you've ever had. Yes, I remember in your book, it, you, you give us even actual verbiage of what to say, what to say when, when somebody's lost. And it's so important because it is a good many of us that have had such a loss for, you know, it's like the words just, what do I say? And, and then you're embarrassed and you stay away and that's not, that doesn't do the job either. Yeah, so, and I, like I even, even the illustration I gave, their silence was one of the worst things they could have done. Mm -hmm. By doing nothing, uh, that hurt actually instead that hurt of helping. That very much, yes. So what about holidays for somebody that's lost somebody? Why are they so difficult and how, what, what is the best way to handle that for somebody? Oftentimes holidays, uh, we as an individual, we connect emotion with events many times. And like Christmas, sometimes it's Thanksgiving. Some people, it's actually the 4th of July family picnic or the Memorial Day weekend picnic or gathering, uh, whatever, or the end of the summer vacation. We always took at Labor Day. Those vacations also are nostalgic. To, and they, there's an emotional connection to the holiday anyhow, um, even in some of the songs, you know. Um, I'll be home for Christmas. Yeah, right. you know, there's even we sing about the nostalgia of and things that happen during that holiday. You compound that with grief and loss, and for some people, it's overwhelming. I mean, they, it's just like a, a mountain of, of emotion that they don't even know how to start to climb. And so um, understanding that as a potential caregiver uh, can give you ideas. Sometimes it's just if somebody else just would in acknowledge they know that I'm hurting a little bit more right now and give me a call and say, hey, I'm just thinking about you. I know it's a hard time and, uh, you know, that uh, anything I can do, maybe we can chat. Something simple like that oftentimes can be very, very beneficial. And as far as the griever, what do you do? Do you do – well, there's – I've done it both ways. Um, my After my first wife died, we actually w did something we never did before. A friend invited us to go to the Bahamas with them at their cost. And so we did it. And that's how we went through the holidays. But after my second wife died Christmas Day, I was home alone. And I cried for three hours. Um, but that's fine. It uh, that's, was healing. And, and then I went out and went to a family, I mean, a uh, community potluck and had a good time. So it, it, having a plan, people that are afraid of the holiday, sometimes by having a plan on here's how we're going to cope with it, that sometimes gives them the courage and the freedom to overcome it. So how would we make the bridge? Because, you know, we're in what I'm doing in the kind of my own ministry is I'm working with mostly women right now that have... They've experienced a lot of loss too because of they've been sex, they've been abused either domestic violence or the issues even from abuse from childhood and they've had to make the break you know from to get away from their abuser and stand up on their own. To me, that's that's also causes a lot of grief and it's a lot of pain and sometimes it's very difficult to to bridge that and holidays and all these other things are so hard because there's nothing that's familiar and they're standing on their own for, the, for probably, for most of them, the very first time in their lives. So the bridge is, it's, I think it applies both ways, doesn't it? It does. And a lot of the counsel, Becky, that your book and you have given to people is right on because one of the steps in processing grief is simply identifying or listing what the loss is, realizing that loss. Um, for some of the ladies that you're talking about, that loss could have been a normal childhood or a relationship with a parent that never existed or moving so many times and never having the freedom to have good friends. You've lost that part of normal living. Being able to identify what the loss is 
oftentimes is a huge step in the right direction uh, for processing and healing it, and then even giving opportunity to realize, okay, this, this is a void here. Maybe I can do something or find someone that would help me um, fill in that void and therefore heal on a faster, a faster rate. But yes, th those losses, identifying them, it's very helpful in the healing process. So that's pretty much why I wanted to both of you to come on this call today and to be interviewed because I, I to me, there's such a grief that is held in their heart and it, in, a, in an essence, it's like a death, you know, um, in that regard. Yes. So how do they find their, your book? And it, um, the book is available on uh, Amazon. Um, you can go to our, my web page. It's griefreliefministries.com forward slash book. There's a link there. Uh, the book is available uh, both in Kindle paperback and audible the audible version is available on itunes and uh so those are ways coming that coming soon in spanish yeah coming soon in spanish and of course if you for those who might want to uh offer me, i've got some here i can mail it to them they can get a hold of me through the email that's listed on the uh on the web page very good what other off um services do you offer david one of the objectives that I had for writing the book, and this is where Becky helped me focus in her counsel, was the oftentimes uh, a book is a good platform for speakers. And that's really where I come from in a sense. I've spent 25 years as a college professor. I've been conference speakers for the last 40 years. And so my forte is to speak and to explain um, what I've learned and help other people on a, a live basis. So my objective is to do that. And so uh, I offer seminars, either any, anywhere from one hour seminars to a four hour seminar sessions for um, organizations, for conferences, for churches, for small groups, uh, for leaders, uh, whatever. Uh, I've spoken at hospice memorial events uh, and was able to connect real well with them. And uh, I also will eventually, in the next year, have available um, some classes online on our webpage that people can, can take and, and learn how to better understand the grieving process and then help others uh, work through that process. That's beautiful. You've often even gone into prisons too, haven't you? I have. I've yeah, spoken in prisons um, and uh, small groups you know, throughout the country, actually. Uh, from Florida to California. Very good. It's remarkable. I've just so enjoyed watching the the growth and the, the the all the things that you guys are just on the road and on the go all the time. I watch you all the time on Facebook, <laughs> and it's really wow. beautiful. So, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience as far as a tip or something that um, you would like to sh you know as far as the wisdom that you have and what you share? What would you like to say? One of the things that I find is consistent in people, people understanding the grief, both the griever and those who might be a caregiver for them, is that grief is a process and not an event. Now, that was a, was a huge lesson for me. My personality kind of pulls that out. Uh, and, but I found other people as well understanding that it is a process and so that process may take weeks, months, or even years, and it's okay. It's not an event that you get over one day. Uh, the other one is when helping or having someone who's grieving, your objective as a griever is not to fix their grief or to make it go away. Your job, basically, as it, as it goes, is to empathize with their pain because it's nobody can take your grief away it's a process you work through and you it's a matter of learning to deal with the loss which you know if it's particularly the closer you are to that person or whatever that loss is emotionally the longer it might take but at the same time in a sense you never quit missing that it's no longer there it's a matter of learning to live with that gone and that's okay. That's just a part of it is. So some forms of grief 
redefine who the person is. And that adjustment, many people, that, that's the adjustment many people uh, don't like about, about grieving, but it's, it's still true. It can be, it makes you, um, makes you a, a different person because of that. Yeah. And just putting it on a stronger basis, the grieving process, you have one choice. You can either choose to be better as a result of that loss, or you can become bitter. Mm -hmm. And that's your choice. Well, that's been the whole theme of our uh, of this book and all of our interviews. It's been really amazing because we all have spoken with each interview. Um, each interview had of people that were women that were wrote their chapter in the book. We talked about the choice that we have to thrive. We've talked about the triggers that will you know, we think we're doing really well and something will hit, you know, trigger. It could be a holiday. It could be numerous different things. A lot of them suffer from PTSD. So there, there, is, uh, there is a process and we have to love ourselves through that. It's so, so important. So to me, your, your book would be just go hand on hand because, um, for the whole process of healing and being well because it is a grieving process that, 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 goes yes. in, that ties in with that. You two are two remarkable people and so appreciate your taking the time. I know you guys are really, really busy <laughs> and doing a lot of things with your ministries and, and I so appreciate that you took the time with us and we will share this out and sh share the links as well. So it'll go out through social media, including YouTube. And um, I'm sure it gets shared. So you're welcome to share them out to your list. To start. <music>